Can China maintain its zero COVID strategy? A handful of infections is enough to trigger new lockdowns and restrictions on travel. How will leaders in Beijing deal with the fallout on the economy and the lives of one and a half billion Chinese? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Rob Matheson. Now, many countries have abandoned the aim of stopping all COVID-19 infections. As the Omicron and Delta variants have spread across the world, most governments have avoided reimposing lockdowns and travel bans. But not in China, where the coronavirus was first detected in 2019. China's first locally transmitted Omicron case was found in Beijing, where the Winter Olympics start in less than three weeks. Now, that's prompted health workers to seal off the patient's residential compound and workplace with their colleagues still inside. 130 kilometers away in Tianjin, 20 infections triggered mass testing for the whole population of 14 million people. Another 13 million in Tian remained stuck in their homes after a handful of infections was detected three weeks ago. Videos on social media have showed long queues for food. China's leaders are urging everyone to avoid traveling for traditional celebrations at the start of the Lunar New Year. Britt Klanet has more from Hong Kong. We lead up to the Olympic Games and the Lunar New Year travel, the largest migration in the world. There have been several uh, Omicron cases uh, in that region, Tianjin being the focus of the outbreak, containment control in the area. One case in Beijing, which is near some Olympic venues as well. So that's prompted a whole range of new restrictions, new measures, including uh, ramped up restrictions, ramped up, ramped up checks for inbound travelers, including PCR tests 72 hours before. That's on top of quarantine restrictions, uh, daily temperature checks, daily tests too. Uh, we understand that some sites have been sealed off in Beijing uh, and several areas are in lockdown as well. So a lot of alarm. Uh, we already know that one case is one case too many in Beijing. They have a closed loop a system in place so that athletes and travelers are separated from residents. But certainly this is causing a lot of alarm for officials there and they are warning people to not travel during the festive period. Well, at first glance, China's economy doesn't seem to be suffering much. GDP grew 8.1% last year. That's above the Chinese government's own targets for growth. But that growth has declined in the last three months of 2021. And some economists are worried about the long-term impact of what China's government calls its zero COVID policy. Lockdowns and factory shutdowns have slowed manufacturing and exports. That's adding to the pressure on supply chains around the world. Okay, let's bring in our guests. In Shanghai, we have Dan Wang, Chief Economist at the Hang Seng Bank in China. In Barcelona, Jeffrey Lazarus is head of the Health Systems Research Group at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. And in Nottingham, Steve Tsang is Director of the China Institute at Soas University of London. Welcome to the programme. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Professor Tsang, I want to start with you. China now has... COVID in its various forms. It's got the Lunar New Year holiday. Millions of people are hoping to travel um, and the Winter Olympics in February. Now, I've seen this described as a perfect storm for China, is it? Well, I think the scale of the challenge for the Chinese authorities will be very significant. Omicron is different from various uh, variants before. So the challenge will be significant, but the zero COVID policy will stay. I don't really see much scope for the Chinese government to change that policy unless Xi Jinping says so. Dan Wang, China's strict approach worked in the early days. There is an argument for suggesting that it was brought in a little bit later than it should have been, but nevertheless, it seemed to work. The economy was, of course, the only one to grow in a significant way in 2020. What kind of do you th impact do you think the continuation of the zero COVID uh, approach is going to have on China's economy now? Uh, well, in the past two years, it is safe to say that a zero COVID strategy has done China more good than bad. Um, because we've been tracking the performance of nine different industries in China, and it looks like the negative impact of the zero COVID strategy was concentrated in catering, tourism, and part of the transportation that's related with, uh, with tourism. 
Um, but when it comes to industrial production, uh, agriculture, and several other types of high-end services, the zero COVID strategy actually had a positive impact, especially for industrial production. And we knew in the beginning of the COVID, China had contained the spread of the pandemic, and that gained China more time to become really the manufacturing center for the world. And that's why the export has been so strong throughout the last two years. Mm. I do agree that this zero COVID strategy has become more burden now, but in the past two years, it was successful. Yeah, the manufacturing uh, industry in China is being hit nevertheless, isn't it? We are seeing factories which are are being uh, prevented from going to full capacity because of staff shortages, because of, of course, not just Omicron, but COVID, uh, but uh, the Delta variant as well. Longer term, do you think that if this is allowed to run, um, if not unchecked, then out with the limits of the, the, the Chinese uh, authorities' ability to, to contain it, do you think that this is going to have a knock-on effect in terms of the supply chains around the world? Well, this, this answer is actually depending on how other emerging economies are doing. Because if we have more COVID variants in the future, and you can see how different governments are dealing with the uh, Omicron, it's not very well. So given what, um, given what we have now, probably the reconstruction and the build up of uh, the supply chain capacity in those other exporting countries will take one to three years. Um, and for China, it will benefit further from uh, the zero COVID strategy if the rest of the world cannot get it together. Mm. So I don't think China is really being the disruptive power for the global stability of the supply chain. It is more of a stabilizing power at this point. Mm. Jeffrey Lazarus, lockdown policies do seem to contain the virus, but they only, if I understand it correctly, work if you have all the ancillary backups once you actually remove those lockdowns to be able to continue to contain, contain uh, the virus. Do you think that China is in a position to be able to do that? I do think that China is in a position to do it. Whether they do it or not is, is another question. So what we're talking about are when as restrictions are gradually removed is ensuring that people are safe so that they all have the high quality face masks they need, which China should, should certainly be able to provide. And that ventilation is improved. So ventilation in places of work, in the manufacturing centers, but also in the homes, restaurants, bars, theaters, and so on. So that's gonna require some effort in making sure that um, proper ventilation is in place um, and ensuring that people do um, always wear the high quality face masks. With Omicron, it's so transmissible that it's very difficult to maintain a zero COVID policy. We already see almost 1.5% of the population in lockdown, and that's only with around two or 300 reported cases a day. So there's probably even more cases that aren't being reported. And as Omicron spreads, I think it will get harder and harder to um, maintain that kind of zero COVID policy. Mm. Uh, Steve, we were talking earlier about the number of uh, areas that were being uh, affected uh, by the uh, continuing presence of the virus. I mean, the industrial city of Qian is going into, I think, its, its third week. Um, how are people in China reacting? What's your take on that? Well, I think overall, the majority or the overwhelming majority of people in China support the zero COVID policy. This is what they have been told us a key policy to make China successful in the last two years. And many people do feel it that way. And most people don't understand how Omicron is different. But for the people in the cities where they are suffering from the lockdown, I think you may get a rather different sense of how people feel about the zero COVID policy. You will have a much more mixed response among people who are being affected, particularly those who are having difficulties getting supplies, food, for example. Uh, just to be clear, who is the, 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 the target, if you like, of their anger? Are they, they gearing it towards the, the central authorities in, in Beijing and in China, or are they talking about uh, the, the way the local authorities are handling this? Well, the way how the Chinese governments deal with these sort of things is that it is never the mistake 
of the central government in terms of overall policy. It is always at the local level where the implementation of the policy is problematic. And therefore, any public anger should focus on that and the central government will fix that. Now, at the moment, I think that is still going to work in China. But if we see much more lockdowns being put in place in Chinese cities or across the country more generally, it will become much more difficult to maintain this particular narrative. Jeffrey, mm. uh, the Sinovac vaccine, um, I have read uh, that there, is, there are some doubts about its, uh, its effectiveness, its overall effectiveness against uh, certain elements of COVID. Um, do you think, given what you were saying about the, the additional things that, that uh, the Chinese government has to have in place in order to, to back up the lockdowns and the lifting of lockdowns, do you think that the, the vaccination process in China is going to be effective enough that it will help to contain the virus should the lockdowns be lifted? I'm not sure that vaccination will be enough. Um, we've seen with the other vaccines, certainly in, in Europe, for example, with Pfizer, um, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Janssen, that it's protecting against severe symptoms, which is good for individuals, good for the health system so it doesn't become overwhelmed, but it's not really limiting so much the spread. And I think that's gonna be the case as well um, in China with the vaccines they're using. So when I mentioned were the additional um, measures that need to be in place, of course, in addition to, to the vaccination. Mm. Uh, Dan Wang, if China isn't able to contain this spread, as many other governments around the world haven't been able to do either, and as a result, more and more people are off work for prolonged periods of time, what do you think that's gonna mean for China's own economy? Because people are staying at home, obviously they're spending less. Well, there is a big compromise uh, being made between what's the best and what's possible. So China now is trying to contain the pandemic in the way, probably the only way that uh, it knows how. And people can still remember vividly what happened in Wuhan uh, in early 2020, when most people were locked at home and uh, the transportation was paralyzed. Also, on top of that, there was a run on hospitals. And that's the most scary part. So now I'm living in Shanghai, even for myself, I sometimes will go to hospital for like the annual body checkup and things like that. Even without COVID, there are not many COVID cases here. Even without that, the hospitals I went to are all very crowded. So just imagine with more COVID cases, even if it's Omicron, um, that's not really as damaging as Delta, um, there would be a run on hospitals and it will be out of control. So the government will try their best to contain this virus at whatever cost it takes, uh, at least until the end of October this year, uh, after the 20th plenum. Mm. Professor Tsiang, the, 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 the Chinese government is, is encouraging people not to travel for the Lunar New Year. Um, the previous time that it did that, if I understand it correctly, it basically stopped people traveling by stopping the trains. Do you think it's going to do something as draconian as that this time round, or is there going to be a different approach? I think they will try to uh, avoid stopping train services, which will make people feel that it's like an uh, e effective lockdown part of part of the transport system. I think they will try to do everything they can to contain any spread to localities, but discourage people from traveling. I think it's going to be a very, very difficult uh, call to make, and it's very difficult to make it completely effective. For a lot of people in China, this is the only time in the year when they have a chance to see their families, and therefore, it's just encouragement for them to not travel really is not going to be very effective in my view. What kind of options do you think are open to the, to the authorities other than simply asking people to stay at home? I think if you are seeing significant increase in cases, then the likelihood is that they will actually suspend some of the uh, train services so that people will have to stay where they are. I think the uh, importance, the central importance of the zero COVID policy is so clearly enshrined in the bureaucratic rule book at the moment that it will be very difficult for anybody at the operational level
to do anything that suggests he or she is not imp implementing the zero COVID policy with enthusiasm. Mm. Dan Wang, we were talking earlier about the fact that uh, it's the run-up to the 2022 Winter Olympics coming up. Now, this is a significant um, global public image event uh, for, for China. China's global image is essentially embedded with that, but it's also embedded in the with the way that it's handling COVID. If the, the, the spread is not limited, if it's not contained, um, what kind of impact do you think that's going to have on China's global image when it's been so adamant that it's going to maintain a COVID zero policy? I think China is facing this dilemma because it has been closing the border for so long. Although now it allows more athletes and uh, relevant uh, personnel to come in with athletes, it's still a very closed country now compared to what we had two years ago. So the policies that uh, the central government in China are making will have a different image from before because miscommunication happens in this situation. We have seen, uh, uh, I'll, I'll quote the words of uh, some of my foreign friends, the exodus of foreigners from China, because either they haven't been seeing their family for two years, they just have to, and uh, the cost of that would be they need to leave their job in China, or they stay, but then they have to endure this long time of loneliness and a potential change of visa policies and tax code. So things have become quite difficult for China. And the Winter Olympics is only a small part of that story. I know it represents an image for China, kind of in a similar way as the 2008 uh, Summer Olympics. But back then, it was such an open country, and people had hope. Everything seemed possible. And now, during COVID, uh, it has become so difficult for the ordinary people. And very unfortunately, most of the, of the cost have been borne by the individual families, like in Xi'an, like in Wuhan. And the benefit is mostly towards the industrial sectors, those people or, uh, or uh, entities that have capitals. So I don't know if it's possible for China to reverse its image in the international stage anytime soon. It just have to try a very hard. Jeffrey Lazarus, the, in terms of the, the, the way that these decisions are made, it certainly seems to be, um, from what Steve Tsang was saying, it's a top-down approach. This is the, the, the policy of the central government and therefore it has to be enacted by, by uh, local authorities. In, in your experience, sort of widening it out around the world, as it were, is that something that actually is effective? Because, as Dang Wang was saying, there is an element of, or there's a potential for miscommunication, and we have seen certain cases of that um, in China, particularly over the, the last year. Is that the most effective way to deal with this? Around the world, we've seen that that has not been, been the approach that's been working. Um, the miscommunication, the lack of communication, um, the feeling from the population of not understanding why the government's making the decisions they're making, the changes they make that aren't being communicated well. Country after country, anywhere you look, communication has been a major problem. There hasn't been this collaborative approach in most cases towards addressing the pandemic. But the current situation in China also reminds me of how certain infectious diseases were handled during the time of the former Soviet Union, for example, tuberculosis. So they're similar to the detention centers that China has, if you tested positive for TB, you were taken out of your place of work, taken away from your family and put into um, centers, sometimes for as long as a year or even, or even longer to address your tuberculosis. And that led people to avoid being um, being detected, so they avoided getting tested. And I'm afraid that might happen in China as well, although I understand that there's some pretty draconian mass testing policies in place. But in general, the top-down approaches um, are just not working, and I'm worried that it probably won't work um, in China as mm. well. Uh, Steve Tsang, we saw in the early days of the outbreak at Wuhan, one of the issues, if I understand it correctly, was an element of miscommunication or interpretation of the situation on the ground compared to what decisions would have been made further up the chain, that local authorities were making decisions in an effort, if nothing else, to either not do anything until the situation rectified itself or became more apparent, or they did almost too much, and in fact, the lockdowns were more severe than the central authorities would have wanted. Why is there this 
apparent, at least apparent to outsiders, disconnect between the central control, the central authority, and the local authorities on the ground? Because of the way how the Communist Party system actually functions. Uh, on the one hand, the party controls everything from the very top down. And this is something that Xi Jinping himself has said, make it very clear. The party leads everything and the core leader leads the party. And then you have the contrary requirements that the core leader in particular is and can never be wrong. And the party central also cannot be wrong. So you put the um, party leaders and officials at the provincial or local level in an impossible position that they have to get it right. And getting it right means delivering the right result. And if they adhere strictly to directions from the above and that policy happened to be wrong, then they are the ones who are responsible for making that mistake. And likewise, if they use initiative and try something different and that doesn't work, they are left holding the cane as well. This is where we are in the way how the Chinese system works. Mm. Dan Wang, President Xi Jinping is expected to seek a third term later on this year. The Chinese Communist Party is going to hold its 20th Party Congress um, in the, the coming months. Uh, President Xi arguably is pretty much certain that that's, he's going to get his third term. But at the same time, he does need to demonstrate that he, has a, he is running a stable country because stability is core to the tenets of the Communist Party in China, isn't it? Well, stability is certainly the key word for uh, the central, uh, central government's work economic work conference in December. And I can see from the economic perspective, that means China has to maintain a certain level of growth. So for the governing capacity, I think China now is at a very stable stage. Uh, as reflected in its ability to contain the virus spread, its ability to uh, maintain a very stable supply. Um, and for a country of this size, I would say that you cannot have a better result by disrupting the economic stability. Um, I don't think there is no cost for such an approach, um, but every country has to deal with its legacy system, and in the U.S., I do have a lot of friends facing different problems, like, say, the goods shortage, which is not a problem at all in China. But they do, those people in America, they do enjoy the freedom now to travel around the country or even outside the country. Many people in China would want the similar kind of freedom. Um, but uh, still, people here respect authorities. They have automatically this kind of collective thinking. They would like to maintain uh, the current situation and do not want the pandemic get out of control. Mm. So in a way, it is why that China and most Asian countries are able to have a relatively low um, infection rate of COVID, but it would also uh, be at the cost of jeopardizing individual freedom to choose. Mm. Jeffrey Lazarus, we're into the final seconds of the program. So if I could just ask you, and this is perhaps a bit unfair, but in a couple of sentences, given everything that we've heard today about the way that the decision-making process is structured, do you think that China, given your experience, is going to be able to adapt the way that it handles this COVID crisis in order to be able to contain it? I hope they will, but we've seen the zero COVID policy fail in Australia. We've seen challenges in countries like New Zealand. So they're going to have to probably tighten up um, and have even more draconian restrictive policies. But the way Omicron transmits, um, I'll be very surprised if we don't start to see case numbers going up in the coming weeks or months. Another question is, is if they will be transparent about their numbers. Mm. That can be uh, you know, more challenging in terms of cases, but in terms of hospitalizations, it would start to become apparent to everyone. Mm. I want to say thanks to all our guests, Dan Wang, uh, Jeffrey Lazarus, and Steve Tsang. And thank you to you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rob Matheson, and the whole team here in Doha, 
bye for now.